Lauren Boswinkle. All right. Um, so I'm going to do a brief rundown on Ruby and polymorphism. So there's my information. But uh, basic lessons that you learned in college, like cat, dog, and lion are all uh, subclasses of animal. That's kind of not the full spectrum of what you can do in Ruby. Polymorphism, polymorphism in Ruby is not just that. Um, it's a duct tape language, so that means that you can actually um, work around just objects. You can have things that simply act like objects. So um, again, what if you needed to handle different types of objects differently and you have no consistent API? I've seen this and I've done it myself. Do something, case statement, widget, sprocket, gizmo, gadget, whatever, otherwise raise an unknown type. And then you start seeing it somewhere else and at another place. But it works, you're good, awesome. Oh God, new requirement. Uh, uh, uh. It should be quick, right? <laughs> Oh, so this is logical branching. Methods now have two or more functions. Code is more brittle and difficult to make quick changes. And really, this just makes Happy Cat sad. Happy Cat has run out of happy. Polymorphism doesn't necessarily mean subclasses in dynamically typed languages. Interfaces, APIs, et cetera, um, are a fantastic way to deal with this. You can call the same method regardless of the type being handled. Um, and compartmentalize special cases to the classes and modules concerning the behavior of those types. What I mean by that is you can build these APIs into your objects, but sometimes our objects don't really want to follow that one specific standard API, like they're often used for different things in different places. So you can just build some adapters or interpreters um, and build those with the API in mind so that you can use them together. And you can, utilize these na you can utilize namespaces if you need to. So modules or just wrapper classes are fantastic for that. This was written on Y day, so it's a little weird. But um, you can just throw a method into a module that actually just, you can just call without saying anything and then have these uh, adapters in that file or in the files with the, or in their own files or whatever. Um, and then this is what that code turns into. The case statement is in one place so that when you need to add something else, you can just add it in that one place, add a new adapter, you're good to go. There's plenty of ways to do this, it's just one. Like really, Ruby's fantastic that like if you can just think of a way to do something, chances are it's gonna work. It's kind of wonderful like that and kind of horrible like that. Um, and really temperance is key. If you've only got one case statement or one nested if or something, don't worry about this, just do that. If you start seeing that case statement or if statement start appearing more times, try thinking about uh, a different way to do it. And again, this is a suggestion, it's not the right way. Look, a puppy. Yeah. That's my contact information. All right. social, uh, not living social, being social, <laughs> and I originally wanted to talk a uh, uh, 45 minute, very long conversation about being social. Uh, my wife suggested that I give this uh, talk to all of you because she thinks I'm a very social individual, that I talk to a lot of people, and it's sort of the reason why I've lost my voice now because I was at the GitHub drink up yelling at random people that I had never met before. Uh, last night, and I spent a lot of time talking to people. I've done it most of my life, and it terrifies me, probably like it terrifies most of you. Um, I don't, uh, I'm the one in the middle. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm wearing the same shirt to help you out. I'm wearing the jacket solely because I have some pitting going on. And that's the one tip uh, that I've learned. Wear a jacket if you're going to pit a little bit. <laughs> it's also a good social tip to like, Look something about yourself, like you're pitting right now. People feel more comfortable about you. But that's not one of our two tips. That's a little side. Uh, I'm Franklin Weber. I work at Jumpstart Lab. Ow! Jumpstart Lab.com. <laughs> 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 we gotta get rolling. Um, uh, so the scenario is you want to meet some people. You're at a conference. There's some brilliant presenters. There's some intelligent people. There's some of your heroes that perhaps you read their book and they changed the way that you did Ruby or worked with Ruby. And, or maybe there's just some sexy men, am I right? That last one on the end there, that's a sexy man. <laughs> maybe you want to just talk to him. I'm being, hey. Uh, so, like, here you are. Uh, what do I say to this?
this guy. He is so gorgeous. And you're, you're uncomfortable about what you want to do and how you want to express yourself. And so, my... Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> you got a preview. Uh, most people say, or suggest perhaps, like, think about people in their underwear. Right? <laughs> it, might, it might be awkward, even more awkward. You might come back and be like, oh god, no, I really don't know what to say to people. <laughs> no, you gotta help me out here. I'm doing something. Are you holding the Maybe. thing now? Uh, what I do, uh, my suggestion, is I look at everybody and I think about them as if they're my grandmother. Uh, this is my grandmother right here. And what I mean to say is, I look at people that I don't know, and I imagine that they're actually someone I do know. I pretend, like when I talk to every one of you, that like we're cousins, or you're my uncle, or I'm your uncle, or we're weird second cousins and it's Christmas time, and we haven't caught up in a while. That works really well, I think, for a lot of people. You can't say be comfortable, be, you know, be relaxed. What I do find comfortable is using some way of tricking your brain into thinking, oh, I know what this state is. And so that's what I suggest. That's my biggest tip. Right there, if you're comfortable and you're easy with other people, everything else usually comes uh, much easier after that. Because it's very awkward standing there talking to awkward people. I just push it <laughs> once. Yeah. So here's me, and I'm thinking about Randall now, but I'm thinking about him as my grandmother, but I still don't know what to say. And maybe he starts thinking about me and drag, so that way, okay, now we can talk to each other. <laughs> <laughs> And so, uh, usually how it goes is we ask these questions like, where are you from, all these things that don't go anywhere. Like, oh, you're from California? Uh, where in California? Oh, I lived in Sonoma. Oh, uh, wine? that's great wine there, I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> How many have had that conversation? Like, you've actually gone, and then you, it doesn't have a conversation usually to go anywhere. Um, the other questions you might ask are something like, I'll share a story about a trip to a vacation, and then you'll share a story about a trip and vacation. And we sort of just talk at each other. And that's something that happens a lot, too. And what I suggest, really, is that you ask more questions. Martin alluded to this. If you pretend to be interested in people by asking questions, or if you actually are interested in people, just asking questions will make it so much more a better conversation. And what I mean by asking questions is staying away from some of those dead-end ones where you expect a particular answer. It's kind of like interviewing people the same way. You don't want those dead-end questions, because then the interview turns awkward. So, We'll leave it at that. Practicing being social. So besides those two tips, there's two things, or there's three things I thought about doing it. Uh, I'm not suggesting that you join the pickup artist community, but they go into a lot of detail about this stuff. And there's some amazing, interesting things that they've done because they're looking at some of these social areas. They're really these really bad nerds doing these things. But uh, some things are good about that community and what they're looking at. I don't mean what they're trying to do with the negs and all this other stuff, but I was really interested in it. Take improv classes, talk to Jesse and other people. It's amazing because you just play and you learn how to play to pe with people. And particularly, you're at a conference with a bunch of people that all are like you, or very similar to you, and have interests like you, so please talk to them. So remember my grandmother, think about her, and ask questions. I'm Frank the Motor. So I really enjoyed that talk by Martin Atkins, and what he's, one of the things he said was be grateful. And I really am grateful that I'm not following him directly after his presentation. <laughs> so he also mentioned uh, building your own Great Wall of China. And I kind of consider this project to be my Great Wall of China. And I want to share it with you and uh, see how you can help and if you want to do something similar. So I have this, this, this technique, a systematic technique for dramatically improving your knowledge of a topic or just achieving a goal. And it, I call it one up. So it's applicable to any, gro any goal. My goal is to become a world-class developer in one year, but it's not necessarily just for this kind of guy. It's really just like for anyone. So the way, the, the general overview is you pick a goal. It's, you give yourself like a year. You break down the year into intervals. Like for me, it's two week intervals. And you pick some topics that you want to hit within you know, one topic per two weeks. You practice deliberately, get mentors, and teach others. And if I break that down, Hmm, Goethe's upside down. I don't know if he likes that. But he says, <laughs> he says, uh, like without haste, without rest. It's like a star moving across the sky. And it gets there because it's going consistently. I guess we have the tortoise and the hare, so the Germans have nothing on us. But So I think make your goal really impressive. You've got a year, so don't let me down. Break it down into two-week intervals. What's nice is it's small enough to stay urgent. If my goal is become a world-class web developer, 
and a year is going by, I, you know, it could be like, it's Saturday, I'm tired, whatever, but if it's like, this is the end of my two weeks, and I haven't written a blog post yet, you got to get on that. So it's really helpful to do it like that. So the new intervals absolve old ones as well. So if you have something you don't like, you'll get past it. You'll get to the next thing. Intervals are cool because pre-planning them helps you achieve balance. It's really easy to go down some kind of rabbit hole when you get into a topic, like I definitely get into topics, and it would go way beyond two weeks. But if I have the chance to plan what I want to hit, I can definitely hit it as long as I plan ahead. And I can share my, my, my list of topics with other people who are experts, and they can help me out and say that's not relevant. Just being able to show other people your stuff helps them to help you. And it helps you time, timing, timing. The shorter feedback loops, and then using, looking ahead for applicable conferences, meetups, whatever, so that when you think, well, I, th I thought to myself, the Git workshop's coming up. I'm going to be learning Git. That's one of my things. And so I'm going to time it. So by the end, I'll kind of know Matthew McCullough a little bit and like help out with his stuff. And it's good timing. You don't learn it if you can't teach it. And I find that if I, what I do is I just sign up. I'm going to give a talk at like a bar camp or whatever it's going to be. And when you sign yourself up, I'm like, here I am. You have to describe it. And it's going to make it really more clear and consistent in your mind to be able to explain it better. So just the order and clarity. Another thing is not just giving talks, but writing, and I call it fighting the ruler, because when you have a big blank page in front of you, you got to fill it up. And just that empty writer's blocky feeling shows that, I mean, beyond the practice of learning how to write, it shows how much you know about a topic. If the words are just spilling out, well, you know a lot, and it kind of gives you some more feedback that way. So another thing is you change. This is related. This is Proust, and he was all about, when he wasn't writing about, like, cross-dressing sadistic dukes. He was talking about like how people change. And when your life is changing, you don't know it after a while. There may be an inaccessible job or an inaccessible romance, but once you're there, it feels totally normal, and that freshness is gone. So the time you want to write, the best time is when you know, this, that you know the topic, but it's still fresh for you. So write at the right time, like I said, in transition. The thing about writing that can trip me up and some people gave me some good advice about this. They said, you don't have to write for your ideal future self. That's someone who knows all this stuff. Oh, man, that's too easy. You can write stuff that's easy to you. Totally easy. It's whatever. It's kind of boring almost. But for some people, that's vitally important, vitally interesting. So believe me, people are out there, and it can be really useful, especially if it's boring for you. That means you know it really well. This one's tough. Be the worst in the room. There's several difficult things about it. One is getting other people who are the best to allow you in the room so you can be the worst there with them. But I think people like to help. From when I wanted to show people my list of things and they know about a topic, they seem really genuinely eager to help me, so I really like that. Um, yeah. Bring an empty cup. This is a pseudo-Eastern story. Every software talk needs some kind of Zen story. So this is this one. There's a monk that goes to a new monastery, and he's like... He's a, he's a novice. The master shows how they meditate. He's like, oh, we do that kind of differently. We stand up and blah, blah, blah. He's going out with his stories. And by the end of this thing, the master brings him to the tea room. He puts down the teacup. He starts pouring it, and he just keeps going. It starts going all over. It just flows all over the floor. And then the novice is like, what are you doing? And the master is like, if you don't have this empty cup, it's just going to flow out. So that's that story. Practicing deliberately is a big aspect of these topics because... If you are on the job, you're being paid because you know how to do something. You know, they don't want you to, I mean, obviously there's some learning with every project, but for the most part, they want you to be pretty good and know what you're doing. So, I, and when I'm working on like a client project, it's like a chess clock has started in your mind. You can't get too deep. If you're getting too deep, you've got to kind of pull up and say, how can we change these requirements or what's necessary? How can we do things differently? But we're going to pull a canoe when we're doing this. Someone said, why don't you use email? He said, well, because you guys are trying to stay on top of things. I'm trying to get to the bottom of them. So that's what Knuth is all about. So get out and co-work. I think it's important because you don't even know the questions you don't know enough to ask. So like when I started working at BendyWorks, I work at BendyWorks here in Madison, I didn't know their workflow with like Git and the way they do things like adding things bit by bit. Anyway, they do it surgically. And I didn't even know enough to ask that. So it's important that you get out and be immersed. And telling the world because when you work secretly, it's less fun and I think it amounts to less. Secrecy is like the dev null of life. Whatever you put in there just kind of goes away, you know? Like, it's way more fun. You get more out of it if you're sharing it. So the detail intervals pay off. Like I said, people, you can say specifically, I'm working on this, this, and this, and people can connect on that. So like I said, real quick story. I spent some time on a failed startup. 
By some time, I mean several years. And uh, it's one thing coding and coding and feeling like you know what you want to make, but until you go out and do the hard thing and talk to the audience, talk to the, talk to the businesses, you don't know what really counts in the world. And so I think it's the same thing with your own personal goals and learning, too. It's not going to be as good unless you like get out there. Be prepared. Make some like business cards you can give out. Oh, damn it. I'll go really fast, really fast, really fast. This is my one, my one year goal. Uh, if you guys want to have your own, tell me about it. That's cool. If you go to oneup.begriffs.com, that's going to be my list of things that I want to learn. You can help me out. Thank you. Hey guys, my name is Steve Faulkner. Um, at Self Full Steve on Twitter. I work for Murphy.com. Quick pitch, quick pitch for that. Uh, we're a startup here in Madison. We're actually hiring. We're looking for two Ruby devs. So if you're looking for a job and you want an awesome job at a startup, come talk to me. Um, just about a block away. Uh, my claim to fame is I went to the South Pole once, so that's me near the South Pole. Um, so this talk is meta meta programming. Uh, a few years ago, when I started Ruby, I had been programming for about six months. I had no idea what meta programming was. And then some people at a Ruby meetup were like, you should check it out, it's really cool. And I went home and Googled a bunch and read a bunch of blog posts and it was definitely once these, like, these kind of moments. It was like, whoa, this is so cool. And I had no idea what to do with it, right? It was one of these things that I, I could see the power, but I absolutely had no clue how it was gonna help me. Um, so fast forward a few weeks later, I finally found an area uh, here at Murphy. We needed um, some analytics done, right? So basic web app, we need all these analytics for all these different things. And they kind of are all a little bit similar. They have similar properties, but they apply to lots of different models and lots of different areas in our Rails stack. So um, I decided to apply metaprogramming to this, although there's probably definitely other ways you could do it. So for Murphy, we are a music startup. We have albums, right? Um, so I was kind of sketched out this metaprogramming idea. Um, and I'm actually going to walk you through how I did it real quick for anybody that's not ever seen any metaprogramming before. Um, I said I want to write a, a module that I can just plug in that's going to be my analytics module. And I want to define methods on that module that will define analytics. And then uh, I want to very easily take all those methods and run them and package it up all in JSON and send it to our analytics server. And it's going to be amazing. So this is kind of what I wanted to do. Um, I also wanted to do time-based stuff. So the previous one was account. This is a account based on time. Um, so this is what I wrote. Um, I basically started with uh, creating a, a hash that's kind of infinitely uh, nestable. Um, there's like gems that will do this for you. Don't worry about it. That's, don't know what's going on. And then this is the first thing I did. I was like, well, let's take this analytics module and let's look at all the constants that exist inside it. So this is every model that will be in my Rails app. Um, and then for each of those classes, we can actually create a string and constantize that string and create a new instances of that class. All right. So this is, this was like the first, like everything I'd done with Metaprogram and I thought it was so freaking cool. Um, so now I have these, uh, basically a collection of new objects. And then for each of those objects, I'm going to look at all the instance methods. That's that uh, count method I was talking about before. And then for each of those methods, I'm going to look at the number of arguments in that method. So if it has no arguments, it must be a count. If it has some arguments, then it must be um, some time-based metric. And you're going to do some stuff with it. I'm going to down case stuff, and I'm going to intern it and turn it into symbols and send it all into a hash, and it's going to be amazing, right? Um, <laughs> So this is what I wrote. This is the actual code. And the cool part is, is then it got really easy to write metrics because it was like, same thing. I just was like, I want to do a genre metric, right? So let's create a method in genres. And I want to do a time-based metric on artists. And so I just wrote this. And it was dead simple. It packages all this stuff up into JSON and actually sends it to a server. And then I actually took it, make sure I have enough time left. I took it one step further. Um, I actually, on the other end on the server, wrote metaprogramming there that would look at the JSON and figure out how it should display the metric based on how many parameters it had, all kinds of cool stuff. Um, the truth is it was terrible. Um, so uh, <laughs> basically this is my first foray in metaprogramming and the meta meta on metaprogramming is, is uh, be careful. So uh, the system I wrote that you just saw is not flexible whatsoever. It's extremely difficult to maintain. Um, as soon as some of the other programmers in the project started poking at it, they were like, what the hell is going on here? They couldn't understand it. Um, and basically, nobody had any idea how to use it. And so we ended up throwing it away later in favor of some other methods. Um, so that's kind of my warning for metaprogramming. But uh, I highly recommend checking it out if you've never tried it before. It's actually really, really cool. This book is really cool. Where is he? Is he in the room? Yeah. Oh, hey. What's up? Hey. It's kind of cool how stuff like that happens with these things. Um, but yeah, so uh, this, is, this is the book on it, right? If you want to learn how to do it, you should go check this out because it's, it actually really is interesting and it can be very, very helpful. The other last thing I'm going to leave you with is that um, 
it really will help once you start looking into uh, actual source code for gems. I really didn't understand any gems or even their Rails internals until I learned how to do some metaprogramming, and then I was able to actually go in and look at Rails and say, okay, I can understand what's going on here, because Rails itself uses a lot of metaprogramming. So, that's it. So uh, this is a lightning talk I've done a couple times, and every time I change the slides around and try to make it funnier, um, I'm pretty sure that it's gotten less funny over time because I'm less drunk each time I do it. Um, and I'm sober this time, so it's probably gonna suck. <clears throat> That's all right. Um, so I quit my job and I started a consultancy that does Ruby and kind of .NET, even though we're kind of you know, done with that, mostly. Um, this is a hilarious slide. I actually just wanted to see a picture of my baby that was 15 feet tall, so hold on a second. That's, that's fantastic. Uh, this is what I call the arrrr face of my daughter. Um, I'm going to make an assumption here that all of you write software for a living, you kick a whole lot of ass at it, and that you're prolific. You go in, you solve problems, and you get along with human beings, generally. This is a picture of the, the day that I left Madison Ruby last year. I got in that car, drove home for three hours, really hung over, and got sunburned. Uh, the beginning of it seemed nice, though. <clears throat> so let's think about all the reasons that we might quit our jobs. One is, is that you're, you might be underpaid, and underpaid is kind of a relative thing because where you live and all that kind of thing, but none of that really matters. The idea is you could quit your job and go get more money. Um, and for instance, my friend went and worked for Redbox and did the worst work that he has ever done in his life, and then he bought a giant sailboat with cash. That couldn't have happened without being tortured badly at, at Redbox for a year. Um, this is a view from our office. It's sick. <coughs> <laughs> Uh, the, the slides really don't matter. I mean, the pictures don't. Um, so let's say that you have a commute. For somewhere to the tune of eight years, I was driving an hour each way to work every day. For a while, it was an hour and a half. That's hell on wheels. If you have to do that, kill yourself. <laughs> this is a website that we put together, styleseek.com. It's got a lot of really cool stuff in the back end. Uh, we put it together, delivered it. It's awesome sauce. Um, let's say you don't have enough vacation. I work somewhere for... Um, Four years, and they gave me a third week of paid time off, which is just kind of sad when it comes down to the fact that that's what we should be living for. We should be writing great software and then getting out there and relaxing and having an okay time. This is something that's timeless. It's the, extra, it's the exact opposite of timeless. It's a boombox with a tape player and a radio thing that's actually a PA, and uh, it's awful. As previously stated, the picture slides aren't really that cool. Um, so the other thing is the market is sick. Every single person that comes up here is going to say, oh yeah, and by the way, we're hiring. Uh, oh yeah, and by the way, we're hiring. Um, this is a combination of uh, pictures of this guy who built this entire circus out of paper mache. It's at the Museum of Science and Industry. It's totally ridiculous, but it's amazing that he did that. And it's clear that he's uh, absolutely insane. Um, one of my jobs actually made me work all sorts of overtime, and I came to find out that I was actually worse at my job because I was working more hours because I was just less happy and I didn't have enough time to kind of fulfill my life of drinking too much. And that made me unable to, you know, release and have a good time. <clears throat> um, if, if you haven't seen this uh, photo, then uh, I don't believe that you write software for a living. Another good reason to quit your job is that you are the best person at your job, uh, or you're just cocky, and maybe you need to quit your job so you can have somebody that's really awesome to learn from. But the main part is, is that you should always be learning from someone above you and having those kind of mentor relationships. Um, <clears throat> this is a 27-pound gummy bear that we gave away uh, in a raffle. Uh, it's disgusting. It's 27 pounds. What do you think you're really going to do with that other than freeze it, pour vodka through it, and get drunk? One of my favorite reasons to quit your job is that you get to stop staring at that code you've been staring at for so long. Um, that's one of my favorites, and it's one of the reasons that uh, I've always liked consulting, is because sooner or later I'm going to go, okay, I need to get out of here. I'm burning out. Please, remove me. And then I can leave that meta, meta programming behind for other people to deal with. <laughs> Subtle callback. Um, this is another picture of my progeny uh, saying, no, you didn't, about a carrot. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, sometimes it's good for a change. We're a small company. We came from the enterprise, and it's an amazing change. We learn a lot about ourselves and about our employees, and we can expand, and we can do startup work, which is really rewarding. Um, here's another 15 pictures of my child, one with Kenny G. If you work a place where all your friends work, then you should probably quit there, too, because you're going to find better friends somewhere else. Pictures of shot glasses and fisheye. <clears throat> Benefits aren't that big of a deal. You can find insurance, ehealthinsurance.com, do some freelancing, have a good time, enjoy your lives. I'm Brad from DevMind. There we go. Okay. It's not Comic Sans. It's the, it's the default one for this theme. Um, it's, ca it's called Chalkboard. <laughs> so, yeah, so I, I had to include the Twitter logo because I don't want to be uh, in violation of their, their new terms. So I wanted to talk about uh, Objective-C. So starting out with memory management because you still get to do that with Objective-C. So there's the rules of uh, C memory management. If you don't know them, uh, you allocate memory and you, you deallocate it when you're done with it, basically. Um, the base class that you use in Objective-C is NSObject. Uh, it's used in both Cocoa and Cocoa Touch for Mac and iOS development. And it's not actually part of Objective-C. Programming in Objective-C on its own is a pain in the ass because you start by writing your own base class. Um, so the memory management in Objective-C is you allocate your object and then you can retain and release it. So you, it's a reference counting language. Um, yeah, or you could use ARC. Um, if you want the object, you need to take ownership by retaining it or allocating it. And when you're finished with the object, you release ownership. Um, it sounds really simple. It's not, which is why we have ARC. Uh, so the point I was going to get to is object orientation is a complete lie. Um, it's a bunch of structs in C. Um, so this is some Objective-C syntax, if you haven't seen it before. Uh, Objective-C uses dynamic dispatch, just like Ruby does. So that means that you can change methods around at runtime. Um, not to the extent that you can in Ruby, but kind of. Because it has to run through a compiler also, which kind of makes sure that things are there. Uh, so dynamic dispatch is a lie. It's just a nice wrapper around a C function. Um, it's the same thing in Ruby, at least as far as I know. I could be wrong. Uh, super classes are also a lie. The super keyword just points to self, but sending a message to super will, will reorder the list of methods to put the methods that are inherited above your own methods. So if you actually check self equals equals super, will be true. They'll be the same pointer. Um, I'm not sure if I got the apostrophes right because it's uh, possessive plurals. English is stupid. <laughs> uh, just kidding. Super classes are real. Um, every object has a is a. Uh, it is a object of its class, and every class struct has a super class. And you can look at your superclasses, superclasses, superclass, and then get its superclass. I don't know what happens. Inception. Yeah, I think they I think they made a movie about that. So this is the uh, this is the structure for an object. It uh, it's really weird. So any instance variables you have in your object actually change the size of the struct, which, from my experience in C, is something that you should not do but apparently they do that. Um, and here is the structure for a class. So it has its isa, its super class. It's weird that a class has isa also. So you can take the class and look at what class the class is and also what class its super class is. That makes no sense to me, but they probably did it for a good reason. And you can get its list of instance variables, its protocols. Um, you can get a list of the method lists. Uh, implementations aren't real. Implementations are actually just a type def of a function pointer. I copied from the docs there. Um, I could read it, but I only have 50 seconds left. I guess I. <laughs> <laughs> 
You can read it. There you go. All right. Got the timer starting? Okay. All right, so uh, my name is Aaron Kalin. I work at Treehouse. We teach uh, web design development, iOS, all that stuff. And I'm here to give you some bartender tips. I was having some trouble figuring out which lightning talk I wanted to give, but since we're all going to be going out drinking, or at least I'm assuming that, uh, I heard there's going to be whiskey and cheese tasting. There may be alcohol involved in that. So <laughs> that's my Twitter handle up there if you want to uh, follow me. But uh, so, and also my awesome ideal bar, I've got a hot bartender before he went crazy. So I'm here to give you some tips about being uh, a patron in a bar, because uh, to give you a little background about me in a short period of time here, uh, my family owns and runs a lot of restaurants and bars in Chicago. So I, you know, it almost set up for me to be like a third generation owner of that, but I wanted to do this computer thing. And they said, you know, get a real job. So I just went and worked for Hash Rocket, now Treehouse. So <laughs> I learned a few things about the bar and restaurant business, and I try to share those at conferences I go to because they have these huge drink ups. Apparently, you guys like drinking. Um, you know, it's a new thing to me, but it also makes me feel more at home with all of you. So let me show you uh, just a you know, few things at a bar that you normally see. This is typically how they're set up, but believe it or not, there's some advertising going on here. And uh, up here, uh, the top shelves and everything next to this hot guy uh, is the call drinks. So these are the, uh, what you might hear is top shelf liquor. It's also the higher price, so there's pricing going on here. And if you want the cheap stuff, or if you call out like a type of, of liquor, like I want vodka or gin, it'll come from down below, or the wells as they call it. So it's much cheaper, and it's also much cheaper to drink up here, I love that. But uh, there's also some ordering lingo, there's like Starbucks aficionados here. I'll admit it, I'll happily admit it, like I know how to order a grande, blah, blah, blah. Oh, come on. First step in, in admitting you have a pro is to admit you have a problem with that, right? So let's start off. So we got short or tall drinks, but they can also be uh, rocks in the high or rocks or highball glass. Um, if you go with uh, an up drink, um, it's my favorite, uh, martinis. This guy. Oh yeah, there we go. That's also why I go by Martini Soft. Um, but I have a feeling with the whiskey thing, uh, you guys will be ordering it neat, which means don't touch it throw it into a nice small glass. Don't put any water in it, no nothing, I don't want ice in it, don't care. So how about this, is there any uh, home brewers in the house? Yeah, do you guys know how to pour beer? Do you? do you? Well this is fun at a party, so if you want to learn how to pour beer, let me give it to you in less than two minutes. So start off at a 45 degree angle, make sure the glass is clean, like wash it out on the inside, uh, aim for the bottom third of the glass because your your object here is not to create any agitation because you don't want to start making the f you want you know get a little bit of agitation going but not too much, all right. And then about halfway full, you want to slowly tilt the glass upright, and then when you get to almost full there, you want to shut that tap off and back away. So because you want to build this head up, and the head is where all that flavor and smell comes from. It's that good part of the beer that everyone loves. So make sure when you get to that full part, back away from the tap, turn it off. You don't want to over pour it. And you want about two fingers length of head. You don't want to go too high or too low, then it won't be just right. But the big thing I'm trying to get across here too is there's customer service involved with being at a bar. So it's a two-way street, okay? So when you're a customer, like the two best tips I can give uh, when you're there is introduce yourself to the bartender. So when you order a drink, before you really get into that, like shake their hand and introduce yourself. Get on a first name basis with them. And like say, hi, I'm so-and-so, you know, blah, 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 let me order my drink. And then when you come back, or at least when the bar gets packed by all the people wanting their free drinks from the sponsored drink up, you can call out that bartender's name and say, hey, you know, uh, Bob or Steve, you know, can I get a, uh, another drink, please? You know, they'll hear, you know, their name being called out and you might get some faster service. And then along with that, if you, especially if you are going up there for a lot of whiskey or whatever, um, make sure you tip well. It's a, it's a two-way street, so if you tip well, Generally, the service will get much better towards you. Know, towards you. If you don't tip at all on anything, I know some of these events, the tips are prearranged, but still giving a little bit extra helps. So, but that's all I got. Thanks. <laughs>